So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, uh, March uh, webinar from the Innovation Policy Platform. Uh, my name is Justin Hill, and I'm sitting in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, on a Monday morning, and I appreciate those who are in the same time zone and have, uh, and have been able to, uh, to connect with this webinar. Uh, today, um, we're talking about a really interesting subject. I think most of our previous webinars have been exploring policy topics that uh, have generally been uh, aimed at a, at a sort of national uh, policy level, but today we're looking at innovation policy as it applies and as it's practiced uh, at the sub-national level, and that means both uh, at regional sort of policy level, but also uh, also even um, at, at city level. And this is increasingly important, and it's uh, I think to some extent it's a sign of the maturity of innovation policy itself. Uh, most areas of policy, uh, certainly established policy, things like health policy and transport and environment are increasingly uh, both uh, conceptualised and delivered uh, at, uh, by different levels of government. And nowadays, innovation policy is also moving into that space. Um, and, uh, and I think that's interesting, firstly, because traditional uh, economic development policy, which regional governments have always been very involved in, have, have focused on attracting investment into the region, uh, whilst innovation policy has some relevance to that, but is just as much about building the capacity that actually exists within a region. Uh, and to do that, uh, you do need local and regional innovation assets. And so today we're delighted to welcome uh, Jose Guimont, uh, who is uh, who's sitting in Madrid. Uh, he is an expert in this area and has quite recently been working uh, on the regional innovation policy uh, set up in Colombia for the OECD. Uh, he is Associate Professor at the Department of Development Economics at the Autonomous University of Madrid, where he's also uh, obtained a PhD from. Uh, prior to that, he got a Master's in Industrial Engineering from Cornell University in New York. Uh, as I said, he's been involved in a number of uh, innovation policy activities for the Innovation Policy Platform, and we're very pleased to uh, to have him today. Uh, this webinar is going to be run the same way as our previous ones. We, uh, uh, Jose is going to present for about 30, 35 minutes, and then he will be open uh, to interact with you and answer your questions. So if you have questions through the presentation, please uh, enter them in the, uh, in the usual way, and we'll collate them and, and pitch them at Jose. Uh, when he uh, when he's finished his presentation. So, Jose, good morning, and uh, uh, thank you for participating in this seminar. And over to you. What I will present today is uh, a summary of, of a paper, this paper here that I uh, developed recently for, for the World Bank, and which is, I believe, uh, you can down, download it from the Innovation Policy Platform and is also uh, attached as the accompanying documentation to this webinar. Now, here you can, you can find, um, this is the agenda for today. I will start with a brief description of the main concepts and global trends. I will uh, move on to discuss the advantages and risks of decentralization of innovation policy. Then I will uh, spend a, a moment talking about a big challenge, which is how to use regional innovation policy to close cross-regional income gaps. Then uh, the next point will be about the division of responsibility between the different levels of government and uh, then the mechanisms for national regional coordination. I will also provide some, some examples uh, from different countries, different experience that I've had in, in recent years and that will help illustrate some of these points, some of these points, sorry. So let me move on to the first point, the, the, the concepts and global trends. Here I will speak of three key concepts. Uh, in the first place, regional innovation systems, the, the, the literature and the theories on regional innovation system from authors like Philip Cook or Howells, 
are can be seen as the as the intellectual rationale for regional innovation policy for decentralizing uh, science and innovation policies. The the <clears throat> the key idea is that the the interactions that lead to innovation take place mainly at the regional level, and uh, therefore regional policy is necessary to foster agglomeration effects and to induce uh, interactive learning by bringing scientific knowledge closer to, to industrial needs. And uh, this is also related to, to, to the, the theories on industrial districts, as in Marshall, and theories of clusters, which again call for a regional approach to, to innovation policy. Uh, the idea that you can see also in this, in, in this quote uh, in, the, in the bottom of, the, of this slide is that regions are becoming more important nodes of economic and, and technological organization in, the, in this new age of global knowledge intensive capitalism. Second concept that I want to discuss briefly is the, the, the concept of multi-level governance. Here the idea is that innovation policy is a complex, multi-actor, multi-level domain and we need to, to make sure that we find a good coordination, therefore a, a good vertical coordination between different levels of government, between the local, regional, national, and even multinational or multilateral. We also need to, to ensure a good horizontal coordination across the different ministries and agencies that, are, that have responsibilities over, over innovation policy. And also, uh, the, uh, this is another, another domain of multi-level governance is the, the, the public-private uh, coordination. Now, here we're going to talk in particular about uh, re regional and national coordination. Uh, and we're going to argue that these two levels are interdependent and complementary. We don't have to choose between a central or, or a regional approach. Both need to be in place. Third key concept is uh, the notion of smart specialization. This is, a, um, this is a concept which has become um, increasingly important in recent times in the European Union, um, in particular because uh, under the so-called RIS-3, which stands for Regional Innovation Strategies for Smart Specialization, under this framework in the European Union, regional governments uh, are asked to, to design their own regional innovation strategies in order to be able to apply for uh, European funding. Um, and uh, the, the debate is whether this is also applicable in developing countries. Uh, many developing countries have become interested in this, in this framework of smart specialization and even within the innovation policy platform there's been uh, some debate on this topic, and if you're interested, you can go to this link and, and read further about smart specialization. Now, turning on to the, the global trends, the first, the first key idea is that there are very large differences between, between countries, right? And, and some countries uh, still have a very centralized model of, for innovation and science policies, Whereas in, in other countries, decentralization has increased substantially. And here, for example, we have just a, a, a few countries, but you can see how, for example, in, in Austria and Denmark, the regional share of public R&D expenditure is quite low, at around 5%. Whereas in other countries, like notably Belgium, the, the level, the share of, of total R&D expenditure that is that is accounted for by the regions is almost 80%. And in China, it's 50%. So total R&D expenditure in China, 50% is national government, 50% are regional governments. The same for Germany. So, so again, large differences across countries. What about uh, developing countries? Um, we, still, we don't have that, that much information. Uh, we don't have a lot of statistical data, but we do know that, that developing countries, uh, this is a more recent trend in developing countries, they have decentralized their innovation policy more recently, 
among other things, because uh, they uh, their investment is in R and D is low. They have low levels of investment in R and D and innovation, and this, combined with the need to be to build critical mass, means that often uh, um, a national approach is more appropriate. In, in addition, uh, developing countries face uh, more challenges when decentralizing innovation policy, given that within their developing countries, regions often exhibit higher levels of diversity, income inequality, and also because of institutional weaknesses in the regional governments. <clears throat> However, we, we can say that since the 1990s, uh, several, especially large emerging countries, have decentralized further their science and innovation policy. This is the case of the BRIC countries like Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And, and again, these are very large countries, so it, it does make sense to decentralize. But also in other countries, and from my experience in Latin America, I've seen that also smaller countries like Chile or Colombia, Mexico, uh, besides Brazil, are also in recent years uh, embracing a more regional approach to, to innovation policy. <clears throat> and in, in less developed countries around Africa, for example, uh, this is less, less frequent. Uh, the regional innovation policies are less common. But however, uh, in recent years, a number of initiatives with our regional scope have emerged, like for example, in Morocco, the Innovation Cities program. <clears throat> so uh, let me now summarize briefly. I'm going to take a step back and summarize what are the risks and the strengths or the advantages of, of a regional approach to innovation policy. Let me start with the, with the risks. Clearly, the most, the most important uh, risk is that if we have a situation where, where all regions are, are fighting with each other to, to reach the, the frontier of science and innovation, then the majority will, will miss the goal because to reach the frontier, you need critical mass. And so the risk is that a regional approach may lead to wasteful duplications, fragmentation of public investments in R&D, implemented separately and uncoordinated in different regions. Uh, the risk also of what some have called the cathedrals in the desert syndrome, where, where regions with weak endowments are, are, are setting up over ambitious uh, infrastructure and R&D centers and, and new technology parks, which, uh, which remain empty. Now, another, another risk is that uh, the central level is necessary to, to, to coordinate a national R&D agenda, sorry, and to fill gaps in regional strategies, right? Because the risk is that, uh, that there may be gaps in the agendas of the regions. For example, imagine if a country wants to find it necessary to, to have a a research center specialized in tropical medicine, but then none of the regions are interested in developing such centers. But then again, from the national perspective, this might be important, so the, the central government needs to intervene. Finally, uh, another risk of re decentralization is that it may lead to a proliferation of public support programs with higher transaction costs, higher bureaucracy, and complications for, for target firms. So this is an overview of the main risks, but of course, uh, decentralization also has a number of advantages. The main advantage is that, as I mentioned earlier, regional governments may be, may be better placed to identify opportunities and to mobilize their knowledge bases because they are closer to the ground. Uh, in addition, decentralization may promote a process uh, of a bottom-up bottom-up discovery of national strengths and priorities by bringing together regional strategies. And also from a more strategic perspective, um, decentralization can promote a healthy competition uh, among regions that stimulates aggregate innovation performance. 
And finally, decentralization may also be important to, in order to reduce technology gap between regions. And um, this last point is, is quite important. It is also controversial. And I will, I will uh, spend a bit more time discussing this last point. How to close cross-regional innovation gaps through our regional approach to innovation policy. Now, uh, we know that innovation is very concentrated in a few regions. For example, in Colombia, just out of the 32 departments or regions of the country, just two of them account for 70% of uh, gross R&D expenditure. And this is the case in, in, in most de developing countries and to a lesser extent also in, in developed countries. And, and these regional imbalances in fact, are very difficult to overcome because of the because because of the characteristics of innovation, because of the cumulative nature of technological capabilities, because of the need for economies of scale and and critical mass. So it is not easy to overcome this regional concentration. But at the same time, it is important to do something about it because we know that that innovation and, and economic growth are are closely linked. And so this implies that if you want to close in income gaps across regions, policies should also seek to close innovation gaps in the first place. Uh, well, this graph just shows how uh, the, the most innovative regions across different countries outpace the national average. What we have here is the R&D expenditure as a percentage of GDP in different regions. Here, for example, we have Massachusetts in the USA, which spends around 5.5% in, in R&D, and this is much more than the national average, which is the, the white dot, which is around 2% in this case. But the same holds for, for most other countries. So then it seems that there might be a trade-off between between scientific excellence and, and regional cohesion, right? Uh, because policymakers need to need to balance two objectives. The first is to promote scientific excellence, and in order to, to promote scientific excellence, the idea is to concentrate resources in the best research groups through open competitions, and this will lead to a higher concentration in, in core regions. However, the second objective is to encourage convergence and equality among regions by, by nurturing lagging regions. And uh, in recent years, it seems that many countries are adopting excellence programs, performance-based funding systems. The challenge is that, that this tends to lead to a higher concentration of resources in, in core regions. At the same time, even if governments try to, 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 to dedicate more resources to, to lagging regions, uh, we often find what some authors have called the, the, a regional innovation paradox, which means that, that even if, if lagging regions need, need a greater effort in, in innovation, they have lower capacity to absorb public funds and they often have difficulties articulating innovative projects that, that fit into the needs of their regions. So therefore, it is of critical importance to, to, build, to build capacity in, the, in lagging regions and to foster inter-regional collaboration. So just a couple of examples of this challenge. Uh, for in, in Russia, for example, this challenge is very evident because there is a large heterogeneity across its 83 regions. And um, in recent years, as the, as, the, um, as the country has moved away from, from block funding uh, of, of R&D, of science and technology, which was the, 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 the main way of organizing the system under, under, under central planning, today they are moving towards a more competitive project-based and the funding system, and this means um, at the end concentrating more resources in the, in, the, in the most advanced regions. An example, a recent example is the 2012 cluster initiative where the central government provides matching grants to regions 
and these regions are finally allocated to the to the more ad most advanced clusters in in the more in the best performing regions. But at the same time, the government is is also concerned about growing income inequalities across region and. Some new programs have been put in place to, to support uh, lagging regions in the country. For example, the Council for Research for Productive Forces have developed four new programs targeting innovation in less developed regions. This dilemma is also apparent in China. And the, even though um, decentralization has been accompanied by, by more regional inequality, the, the government has uh, is trying to revert this trend by, by providing more support to backward regions, such as, for example, through the so-called revitalization plan for higher education institutes in mid and western China, which funds R&D projects to strengthen universities in less developed regions. So let me now move to the fourth point of my presentation, which is about the division of responsibility between levels of government between the national and the regional level. And the, the idea is uh, that perhaps some innovation policy instruments are best provided at the national level, whereas in other cases, it may make <clears throat> more sense to, to decentralize. So, there, so, so we might have some sort of an asymmetric des decentralization across policy instruments, in the sense that some policy instruments should remain uh, at, the, uh, at the central level, whereas in other cases, it makes more sense to, to decentralize. <clears throat> in this table, we, uh, this is an attempt to classify the main focus of, of national and regional innovation policy. Uh, and this is not always, this is difficult, and, and we, we don't mean to say that this is the best approach, but based on international experience and a review of the literature, it seems that uh, the scope of national and regional innovation policy is somehow different. For example, with regard to the mode of innovation that is being targeted, uh, more often national governments focus on, on scientific creating new knowledge, you know, uh, scientific uh, innovation, etc. Whereas the regional level has a stronger focus on knowledge diffusion and exploitation. There are also differences in the main target groups, such that the national level often focuses on, on uh, public research labs, universities, or very large companies, whereas the regional level tends to focus more on small small firms, SMEs, startups, spin-offs, <clears throat> developing infrastructure such as incubators, science parks, special economic zones, etc. With regard to, to regulations, <clears throat> normally the, the intellectual property rights are in the are the exclusive responsibility of national governments, whereas other kinds of regulations such as building permits, infrastructure development, etc., are in the hands of regional governments. With regard to uh, economic transfers, then <clears throat> normally tax deductions are the exclusive responsibility of national governments, and which also provide large grants to, to new R&D projects, whereas regional governments focus normally on smaller grants to fund business innovation. Um, in any case, and, uh, and so on, I will not continue, but in any case, uh, it is important to, 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 to note that uh, drawing clear, clear lines of separation between national and regional competencies would be counterproductive, because certain policy instruments are best executed if they are shared um, between the two governments. So this is kind of a more cooperative approach that can benefit from complementary strengths around a single public policy issue. In fact, <clears throat> sorry. In fact, uh, a recent um, study by the OECD found that there is a large overlap in the kind of 
policy instruments used at regional and national level. We can see it in this in this graph. The the blue line are the number of instrument policy instruments used by the central government. The white line are the number of policy instruments used by regional governments in each country. And the, the, the black line are the overlapping or common instruments, those that are used by both governments at the same time. So we see a, a big overlap. Uh, we only have uh, one developing country here, Mexico, a middle-income country, in fact. And uh, <clears throat> we see the overlap is not as high as in other uh, OECD countries, but still there is quite a lot of overlap. And in fact, this overlap is not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes it's a good thing. Uh, overlapping uh, policy instruments can create synergies if both levels complement each other. And there, we might find this complementarity in the way the policy instruments are structured. For example, across target actors, eligibility criteria, etc. Or there may be synergies, for example, if there is a collaboration between the national and regional level, joint programming, joint financing of, of policy instruments. Uh, however, uh, overlapping uh, na uh, national regional overlaps can be negative if they create redundancies. And these redundancies are often uh, uh, seen in, the, in a lack of awareness of the instruments developed at another level of government, in a failure to distinguish between target groups, or in an increase in the complexity and bureaucracy for potential beneficiaries of public support. Let me turn now to, to, to the fifth point. Clearly then, uh, rather than deciding what kind of uh, policy instrument should be in the hands of the national government and which responsibility should fall on the regional government's hands, it seems that the, the key issue is rather to, to improve coordination, to improve national regional coordination. And <clears throat> So national regional coordination should be fostered at all the stages of the policy cycle from agenda setting processes, for example, by uh, putting in place policy council that bring together regional and national uh, policy makers. This should also be, the coordination should also be fostered at the design and implementation stage, for example, through joint programming, joint funding, etc and also at the evaluation stage through sharing information, reporting, etc. And there are many different instruments for, for um, national regional coordination through institutions, norms, and information. Um, and now I will present you some examples of these tools or mechanisms for national regional coordination. The first one is from, from Chile, and it's a very recent example. In Chile, CORFO, which is the, 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 the National um, uh, Innovation Promotion Agency, the, during the last year, the, the CORFO has been establishing regional offices across the, the 15 regions of the country. And this, these regions are regional offices of Corfo, but they have high levels of autonomy and they depend on, on the regional governments. And in this process, Corfo is making a strong effort of capacity building to support regional governments. And, and this process of creating the regional ag agencies is conceived uh, rather in a similar way as the, as the smart specialization program of the European Union. In fact, they also call it smart specialization program. And the idea is to, do, to support the development of clusters throughout the different regions of the country. Um, another example is this time from, from Colombia, from Medellin. And this is an example, not, not of a region, but of a city that has de developed its own very ambitious innovation strategy. And it has created a new uh, innovation agency called Ruta N, which was created in 2009 by the City Council. It is very interesting also how it is financed because the, this agency uh, 
is financed through a levy on the profits of EPM. E EPM is a huge public company owned by the City Council of, of Medellin. It is a public services company which provides electricity, gas, water, and telecommunications. So it is this company that provides the funding of the agency around $30 million per year. And uh, so this agency, Rutan, has developed a wide array of, of, of programs and policies, mainly focusing on entrepreneurship. And, and it has developed a, a new strategy, a new science, technology, and innovation plan up to 2021 with the ambitious objective of becoming the innovation capital of Latin America. And it is also developing a new district. You can see a map of this district in the, on the right, called the Medellin Innovation District, aimed at attracting new companies, attracting both foreign and national companies to develop R&D and public R&D centers, etc. <clears throat> now, uh, also in Colombia, I find uh, very interesting the, the new, a new fund that has been created to, to, to support science and technology and innovation in the country. And this new fund was established in 2012, uh, and it was allocated with 10% of the national royalties from mineral resources. So it is also interesting because uh, the, the, the country, this law uh, uh, implies that 10% of all the income from mineral resources that the government accrues is dedicated to science and technology as a way of diversifying the economy. <clears throat> uh, and the, these funds, which are, this is around $500 million per year, although now the, the price of oil has gone down, so it's probably a bit lower. But anyway, it's a big, a very large amount for a country like Colombia. And these funds are distributed later to the regions based on their population and income levels. The fund is administered by, by Colciencias, which is the National Research Funding Agency, but the projects are selected by regional governments. So it is the regional governments which need to come up with their own strategies, which need to decide what they, they want to fund within the regions. Uh, the problem is that many of the less advanced regions that, that receive the, the largest part of the funds lack the capacity to design and develop the right kind of projects to promote innovation and therefore Colciencias has established an office of regionalization that, support, that has supported so far the drafting of 27 regional development plans for STI. And now the, the government and Colciencia is struggling with, with the fact that they are finding it very hard to, to, to induce the regions to collaborate with each other, and this is leading to some extent of fragmentation and duplications. So this is an interesting case to, to follow up in the future years. Another interesting example is from Mexico, the so-called mixed funds or fondos mixtos, which were established in 2002 jointly by the central and the regional governments, more or less regional governments contributed with 45% of these funds and the national government with 55%. 55%. And the objective is to foster innovation at regional level and to better articulate federal and regional support for innovation. So each fund has its own technical committee and, the, and, and its own evaluation commission and they issue calls for proposals and select projects for funding within their respective regions. So let me conclude here uh, just with, uh, with a number of, of ideas of how we need to, to rethink the, the, the role of national governments, or the, the, the role of national innovation policy within an increasingly decentralized scenario. First, the, clearly we need a, a shift in the orientation of central government from control towards facilitation, capacity building and, and support. Uh, it is important to promote a, a more a kind of bottom-up participative approach, but at the same time, it is also imp important to ensure coherence of regional innovation strategies, to search for economies of scale, and to reduce fragmentation. 
as I mentioned earlier, another key challenge for developing countries is how to manage this trade-off between scientific excellence on the one hand and regional convergence on the other. And as I, as we discussed just in the last, last slides, a key issue is to design flexible governance systems that allow for an asymmetric decentralization across regions and across policy instruments. Uh, and finally, it would be dangerous for developing countries to be to, to, to go too fast in decentralization, to be too enthusiastic, because decentralization and the institutional reform should be sequential in tandem with the development of regional capacities. And I will conclude here. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to your, to your questions. Thank you very much, Jose. That was uh, that was really interesting. Um, there are a number of questions that have come in from the audience, but I'd like to start with one of my own. Uh, the you've spoken a lot about how in many countries R and D is very heavily concentrated in just a couple of regions, and even in Spain, your own country, uh, uh, I think it was 60, 70 percent of R and D is only in in three of the 17 regions. Uh, and presumably that's also the case in that very interesting example from Colombia. So what does a regional innovation policy look like in a region that isn't particularly R&D intensive, that may, be, uh, that may have a lot of agriculture or a lot of uh, mining, but, but not much else? Uh, what, uh, is it sensible for them to be aiming to reach the, the technological frontier, or is it a, a quite a different looking regional innovation policy? for those types of regions? Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> that's a good question because in fact I was speaking sometimes of R&D, sometimes of innovation, and in fact innovation is, uh, as all of you know, much more than, than just R&D. And, and even though R&D is concentrated in some regions, this doesn't mean that the rest of the regions don't innovate. And, so innovation is contextual. It doesn't mean to create something new for the world. It might be something new for the region, new for the, the, some group of firms, for a cluster. So, so indeed, in lagging regions, also need to innovate. And probably the regional innovation strategies don't focus so much on R and D, but rather on technology extension, on the diffusion of technology. <clears throat> on supporting entrepreneurs, business incubation, etc. Thanks. Um, perhaps a related question uh, that we've had from uh, from Desiree in the audience. Uh, she asks, "What are the market failures that justify supporting innovation, especially in those lagging regions?" <clears throat> so, okay, the. the in, in the innovation policy literature, uh, market failures traditionally were associated with uh, the lack of appropriability, right? Uh, and so innovation policy was related to, to putting in place an intellectual property right regime or with public expenditure in, in, in research, especially in basic research. But then, with the innovation systems literature, we speak not only of market failures, but also of, of systemic failures, right? Systemic failures have to do with a lack of collaborate, collaboration between the actors, lack of collaboration between companies and universities, or between the government and the universities and the private sector. So I, I think this is a more interesting discourse uh, to justify uh, to justify regional innovation strategies, right? In order to, to address these systemic failures, the, in order to address the lack of collaboration among actors, which is very important for innovation, then probably we need a regional approach where those regional governments are more aware of, the, of how the different actors in the regions behave, of the problems in these relationships between actors, etc. Well, presumably they're more aware if they have capacity, but as you've indicated in the example of Colombia, perhaps in some cases regional governments don't have that capacity. Does that mean that maybe they're not able to um, assess their own strengths or, 
or is that lack of capacity does that present in a uh, does that show up in a in a different way? Well, yeah, it's it's never easy, right? And and the the, the, the answer there, I, I guess, would be that what you need is a collaboration between the national government and the regional governments in, in case of a lack of capacity and and there's a stronger focus of national governments on capacity building and, and helping regional governments address their own inefficiencies in their territories. Okay, we've got a question I think you're very well placed to, uh, to answer and it's around the relationship between uh, regional innovation policy thinking from the European Union, which you've discussed a bit, and how appropriate it, it is for the developing countries. Um, in particular, um, Christian notes that most uh, countries in Latin America have developed their agenda by following broadly the model of the EU and he's interested in whether you think that's a sensible approach and maybe what are the, what's good about the EU approach as it, as it might apply to developing world and, and, but then secondly what doesn't perhaps work so well. Um. Well, yeah, I agree that that there is a, that many countries are trying to, to implement this, this same kind of system, and I think it it, tra it can translate very well to, to developing countries. In, in fact, the, the the examples I I used from Chile and also the the royalty fund from from Colombia is is, is sort of based on that approach. Uh, what, what I see is that the, the European um, framework probably has a stronger focus on, on R&D, on research and development, and, and so regional strategies need to have a strong R&D component, whereas this may not, not be necessary in some other developing countries. So again, we, we, I think what we need to do is to broaden a little bit the the definition of innovation and include other kinds of innovation, not only R&D and state-of-the-art uh, knowledge production, right? And, but overall, I think it's a, a very, a very useful framework. If what what we are thinking of is of uh, pushing regions to develop, to think about their own innovation strategies and to develop bottom-up regional innovation strategies. And only this way can can they be able to to apply for national funding. I guess that's the other important difference is that the EU is is like a rich uncle. Uh, it's sitting there with with a bunch of money uh, that is uh, supra national, whilst in the vast majority of of our countries, they have to come up with their own money, even if it's at a national level. <coughs> yeah, but many many countries. Uh, my, experience, my recent experience is in Latin America, so I cannot speak of other countries, but many, many countries in Latin America have, have secured a, a, a lot of additional funding now for R&D, and they are thinking of the best ways to, this, to, to use these funds, uh, such as Colombia with the Royalties Fund, or also Chile, and, and, so, and this approach is useful to try to distribute it more evenly across the regions and to but again, it's, it's also very challenging, as we have seen, yes. You mentioned uh, uh, one of the examples was from Russia and indicated that over recent years there has been an attempt to uh, diversify their innovation policy and push it down to a regional level. We have a question uh, from Daniel, who's, uh, who's in Russia, who mm -hmm. makes the observation that uh, that the cluster initiatives are still fairly top-down in approach. Uh, and maybe um, maybe they don't uh, focus so much on local SMEs, and um, and and so p potentially those regional innovation policies are uh, are not so reflective of local, um, I guess, local economic realities. Would you have any observation about that? Mm. I think that's uh, an, an interesting comment, and, and probably it's a correction to, to what I was saying. To be honest, I'm, I'm, I haven't gone into the case of Russia into a big depth. Uh, this was 
I developed this case uh, speaking with some experts from the World Bank that have been involved. And I mean, I'm sure Daniel is right, and, and it's still not completely it's still not completely bottom up. But I think there is clearly uh, the country clearly is working towards that direction. Maybe slowly, but that's the direction that innovation policy is adopting in Russia. I would say. Uh, a question from Elizabeth, uh, which uh, is, is about uh, youth innovation um, uh, and whether uh, you have examples of initiatives that uh, perhaps are focused around universities, but, but um, getting uh, young entrepreneurs involved uh, and maybe uh, involved in the innovation process, maybe the work, uh, your recent work in Medellin might be uh, might be a good example of what they might be trying to do to incentivise and make that that uh, young entrepreneurship space happen. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not sure how this relates exactly to the regional uh, regional policy discussion, but but indeed this is a very important topic. Uh, and the, the first point is promoting an innovation culture, right? And this starts from the school and through outreach activities and special courses on, on entrepreneurship. And it continues through different kind of activities, seminars. And indeed, in Medellin, this is, I would recommend, recommend Elizabeth to, to look into the website of Ruta N because they are, they are indeed developing many interesting projects to try to promote uh, innovation entrepreneurship in, in the young people, especially young people in disadvantaged neighborhoods that were previously disconnected from the city and that were uh, affected by all the crime and with, related to drug cartels, etc. So they have very interesting initiatives linking innovation with entrepreneurship, with young people, with providing opportunities to the disadvantaged and linking it also with social innovation in, in Disadvantaged neighborhoods, building new internet centers, new incubators, new small grants for entrepreneurs without being too costly for the government, but stimulating a new ecosystem where where young entrepreneurs see new opportunities. I guess it's a good example of the sort of tool that is available and, and is probably most appropriately uh, used either at a city level or at a regional level as opposed to that sort of national innovation policy. Yeah, right. Um, we'll, we'll put a link to, uh, to that uh, innovation agency site. Um, uh, a, a couple of questions from, um, from Mus Mon Musambia, who's sitting in Tanzania. Uh, he, and I think he's trying to work out um, in countries where innovation policy is new and where regional capacity is low, um, how uh, how realistic it is to expect a bottoms up approach to um, to be very effective, uh, and I guess perhaps a follow on question from me, in your experience, in regions where there is there isn't much innovation capacity, what what are the what are kind of the first steps that you need to take or that regional governments can start to take to build their capacity? Uh, in developing a bottoms-up innovation policy? What's the, um, how do they start to move into that space? Okay, that's a, that's a difficult question and a very broad one. But uh, let me start with the, 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 the first, the, the, the question from uh, Musambia. Uh, I, think I, would, I, I probably agree with, with the idea that in, in this country, in less advanced country and probably maybe Tanzania, then in this kind of setting, maybe a, a regional innovation approach is not so relevant and it's more important to first build the national capacity and to build critical mass in R&D, to develop a couple of good universities with PhD programs. And so this should be the priority at the beginning. Now, uh, at the same time, uh, if, uh, you can start uh, trying to develop some capacity at regional level. 
And the starting point, of course, is to is a mapping exercise to, to map the resources in the region, who are the most innovative companies, uh, what, who, who are, where are the universities, if any, what, what are, try to, to build some dialogue among the different parties in the region. Probably this dialogue can be orchestrated by international experts, consultants, and try to develop this kind of mapping exercise, probably looking into the main weaknesses, into the bottlenecks, and into what, what kind of actions could be developed in the first place. But again, this is a very challenging uh, arena. Um, a question from, uh, indeed, from uh, Edwin, who's in Colombia, uh, from the National Planning Department. How do you, uh, or what mechanisms have you seen that uh, either depoliticize the um, process of innovation policy, or at least minimize the potential for especially local politicians to, um, uh, I don't know, if interfere is the right word, but to uh, uh, maybe to uh, overly be overly influential, um, and I guess that relates in particular when you're trying to develop medium and long-term strategies. How do you, how do you either get the, the political cycle out of it, or, or at least reduce its impact? <clears throat> and uh, in fact, we were looking into this with the in the case of Colombia, uh, because of course, because the, the projects were funded, if I remember correctly, for an horizon of four years, and then. Uh, the problem is if there is a change in government and suddenly they want again to develop their own and, and new policy, new projects, and that's the temptation of any new government that comes in, then four years is not enough for a, for a R&D project to, to succeed, to, to, to provide some returns. But how, to, how to avoid this? Well, probably what you need is is uh, an evaluation panel with independent experts, both national and international experts, and some kind of more automatic renewal for, for projects so that they don't have to be, again, selected by the new government, but they can be renewed automatically, at least the most successful projects. And this is something that we were discussing with, with some of the policymakers in, in Colombia. But uh, it is difficult because the regional governments don't want to curtail their, their own capacity to decide. And, and new governments, as I said, always want to change things and to prioritize maybe a different kind of projects. But, but this is, I agree, a very, a very important uh, issue that needs to be at least with further reflection. And it's fair to say it's not just an issue in developing countries. It's, sure, uh, sure. it's something you see yeah. <laughs> absolutely sure. everywhere. Uh, sure. A question from Carlos, who's in that uh, struggling developing country of uh, France. Do you have any examples of successful innovation policies that uh, leverage both regional and national resources? Uh, and I guess Colombia might potentially be, be one of them, but uh, have you, uh, and Chile for that matter, have you got other examples? Hello, Carlos. So, uh, well, since you are in France, let me put an example of France. And, and the, in France, they have a program, I think, since 2001, that is called the Pulse of Competitiveness program. And this is a national pro program. What they do is uh, select cluster initiatives. So, we, uh, it's a competition, and different regions can, can apply for national funding under this program. And the program rates the different clusters, and those that are considered to be a national priority then receive additional national funding. So then they are national and funding to leverage regional resources. However, those that are not considered a national priority, then those stay purely in the hands of the regional government, and the national government does not intervene. This program seems to have worked pretty well, and it's also a quite common program in other in other countries, a quite common way of organizing cluster initiatives whereby the national government selects the best countries in the region and provides additional funding to them. 
Um, one more question. You you held up the policy note that you'd done for the IPP, which is called Regional Innovation Policy and Multi-Level Governance in a Developing Countries Between a Rock and a Hard Place. What do you mean by between a rock and a hard place? Well, this is a, an expression, but what, what I mean with this is that it's not, it seems it's not easy to, to decide whether a whether decentralization is a good approach or not in developing countries. Of course, there are many reasons that support decentralization, but at the same time, uh, it is very challenging to, to implement it right. And national regional coordination is very difficult to, to, to achieve. So that's why we, we, we are moving between a rock and a hard place. Both both solutions are not are unsatisfactory. Uh, both are very hard. You cannot continue with just a purely central approach, but a regional approach is also very challenges and has a lot of inconveniences. Okay, look, thank you very much. That's um that's probably, uh, I think that's our time limit uh, that's come up. I'd like to thank, uh, on behalf of the World Bank and the Innovation Policy Platform, Jose, for what's been a really interesting um, presentation, both, uh, and what I liked about it was uh, not only did he talk about the theory, but also gave some really interesting examples of, uh, of what's happening on the ground, particularly in Latin America. Um, Daniel, I see your question, but we'll, perhaps we'll answer it offline. If others have got questions about this, uh, uh, this topic, please keep, uh, keep uh, posting them, and I'm sure Jose will be happy to answer them, uh, or, or we can help answering them through the Innovation Policy Platform. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for wherever you are in the world, uh, and for the IPP, uh, farewell until the next presentation.